There is no end to their greed. They're taking your money. Such are the ways of Wall Street. That's why we need government intervention, says the left. Without it, I can just take the whole cake. There's nothing stopping me. So take the cake, make new ones. My guests say greed works. Greed is a good thing. Greed is never bad. Greed is right. Greed works. Is greed good? That's our show tonight. And now, John Stossel. Greed, such a nasty word. People say greed caused our financial problems. People hate greedy bankers and other businessmen. And lots of people in business are greedy, but then again, aren't you? Who isn't? At ABC, I did a documentary on greed that included an experiment that showed how greed can be self-destructive. We're going to play a game. The Psychologist the Julian Edney tests people's greed dollar by bills. putting dollar bills in a bowl and saying, at the word go, you can get as many dollars for yourself as you can. But every 10 seconds, if there's money left, he'll double it. If there's two dollars left in the bowl, I will put another two dollars in. But the game ends the if the contestants empty the bowl. So, on. so what happens? Ready, steady, go. <laughs> they could have made more money if they just left half the bills in, but they don't work that out. Even when we let them do it again. Sally Cohn is a liberal blogger who writes about that selfish attitude and how government sh must temper it. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, in part, look, I don't think greed is a bad thing at all. I mean, we all have a little bit of greed in us. The question is, what values do we hold alongside greed as a, as a country, as a society, uh, that we encourage that balance out those impulses so that we operate for the better good of everyone? All right, Don Boudreau is an economist from George Mason University. He takes the libertarian position that government should butt out except for enforcing rule of law. What do you mean? Well, property rights, which actually constrains self-interest. I actually don't like greed, but I like to distinguish between greed and self-interest. We're all self-interested. We care more about ourselves, our family, and our loved ones, than we care about strangers. That's just who we are. And any economy that we have will inevitably be based on self-interest. The problem with greed is, it's people grabbing more than they deserve. People grabbing beyond the rules. What do you mean it, than they deserve? It, Who decides what we deserve? I don't think there's a difference between the two. The, the market decides. And the problem with the government is that it is the one institution that best allows people to grab more than what they deserve. Huh. Government is the institution that fuels greed far more than markets ever did. You know, Don and I agree on part of this, right? Like, I think for too long, government has, in fact, been operating to, for instance, allow big businesses to get, uh, you know, a bigger share of the market crony than capitalism. small businesses. Crony capitalism, exactly, facilitated by government. But there's also a positive side to government as well, which, you know, we agree, I think. Self-interest is a human uh, impulse, right? But we temper that impulse with other impulses. We don't just say, you know, look, you're allowed to go do whatever you want to do on your neighbor's lawn or in the public square or this or that. We also have values of community. We have values of the common good to right, but constrain let's, those let's impulses. Let's turn to business. This is the business channel. In that experiment with the bowl of money that we showed earlier, the participants eventually do figure out that it's in their greedy self-interest to create property rights, to not empty right. the bowl. If we each take a dollar at a given time, mm -hmm. then there will never be it will never ten. empty the bowl. They're just as greedy, but now they're cooperating. I would argue, without government, except setting the rule for if you own it, it's yours. That's what but business does. Second, but in a sense, John, there are four people coming together and saying we're going to operate beyond our own individual self-interest. That is what government is. That's why the Founding Fathers created a government. That and that's what why McDonald's we create does? one now. Right, but McDonald's doesn't include everyone in the community, right? That's but if in, they by tip people off in the community, they lose but that's customers. By definition, what again, what a government does is it says, look, and, and the part of the other formula that's missing from what Donna's saying is what about inequality? To my mind, this is sort of like <laughs> Uh, you know, let's imagine we were all part of a large family, right? And we had a cake that we all had to share, right? Except let's just, I know it's hard to go there, but imagine for sake of argument that I happen to be the, you know, stronger, more hardworking member of the family. So, you know, I get like a decent, you know, hunk of cake that I get to have, right? And that's my cake. And you guys, you know, Don here, he's the littler kid. He hasn't worked as hard. Maybe he hasn't tried as hard. He gets a littler piece of cake that he has to live with. And so, so that's America the is we have unconstrained greed. 
America is like one cake, and if the rich take a big piece, we all have less? Look, there's no, there's, there's no lying. We can also try and grow the cake. But the reality is ah. right now, as a society, we have fixed resources where we say, look, if you're going to cut taxes for we, the wealthy, then that means less... We have fixed less, resources? We, it, literally, right now, if we say we're going to cut no. taxes for the wealthy, then no. that means we're going to have less to, less to spend on public programs that help poor and low-income no, people, no, that help them get that's, more... That's just not true. I don't like the, the, the analogy, because it makes it seem as if the economy's wealth is a, is a fixed size. And if that were true, then indeed, the more you have, the less there is for, for me and, and for John. But that's not the case. It's a bad analogy. It seems to say that if Bill Gates takes $50 billion, he takes this huge piece and we have less. It, I, I would argue he baked a whole new cake or several. Oh, Steve Jobs baked a cake and, and all these entrepreneurs greedily pursuing their own self-interest, sure, that, that they make us all rich. And you know what? That's why Bill Gates, he can have a ginormous piece of this You're cake. You're okay and with that. he does. Yes, he can have a much bigger piece of cake. But look, the problem with inequality and the problem whether you have one cake or four cakes or even an infinite number of cakes is that inequality tends to compound itself. Unless we say, you know what, we want to make sure you have a chance to help bake your own cake too. We want you to have the government programs, the public education, the quality roads, all of those things that helped your cake get baked in the first place too. I think that's historically inaccurate. If you look at the time in America where you had less government, the, the least amount of government in our history, really the 19th century, people think it's the, the rich that got richer. The people who got rich were John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, people like that. They came to, Rockefeller was born, Carnegie came to this country with nothing. They made huge cakes, which made the rest of us wealthier, and we all but became... that's the key. They made the rest of us well. I, I don't. I, 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 you don't agree I would, with that. I would quibble with that historical analogy. I mean, you don't think instance, Rockefeller you know, made the, the rest of us you know, well, I mean, wealthier? He lowered the price of oil. Hugely, you know, look, 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 I'm not blaming anyone for success. I don't think anyone, any progressives are doing that. Are saying there shouldn't be entrepreneurship. There shouldn't be incentive. You want to balance that with the kinds of public infrastructure that creates opportunity for the next generation. Things like the GI Bill, things like good public schools, things like roads that help the next generation of companies get their products to market. Let's talk about inequality. It makes me uncomfortable. And it's true, some have much more. And yet, what you economists have taught me is by letting them indulge their greed, their pursuit of more money for themselves, that made poor people better off. In the last four years, there has been a quote-unquote economic recovery. And 80% of those gains have gone to profit, and 1% have gone to wages. So it doesn't, it doesn't bear, the facts don't bear out well, that if people unequal, just get more and more. It's very unequal, but 1% is better than no percent. Wow, well, I beg you to tell that to the 1% of people who've had stagnant wage growth for the last generation. Look, the reason the economy's not growing has nothing to do with what you mentioned. It has to do with the fact that, we, that, that the government is way too big now, and it's promising even more taxes if the current administration gets, gets elected. And that's why investors are staying on the sidelines. Corporations want to make more money. They don't want to sit on their hordes. They're sitting in the hordes because they think that the future right, They want to make more money. That wanna, takes it from me. But the, uh, but the beauty of the market system, the beauty of private property rights, is that they can only make more money by making you and you better off. That's the beauty of it. Listen, if I thought it were true, and I, I mean this, I, I'm not ideological in the sense, if I thought it were true, I would say, look, hey, Don, you can have the whole cake. Go okay. ahead. You can have the whole cake if somehow eventually some but, of that cake is going to trickle down but, to me. Uh, but I know how the biological system works. It ain't going to trickle down in the way I like it, and facts haven't you're, bared you're that out. Your analogy is wrong. You're talking about people you get, giving it from you to me. People make their cakes. Steve Jobs became rich, to use him as an example. He baked a lot of cakes, but he got his own large cake only by baking lots of other cakes for lots of other people. That's how he became rich. I personally don't care if he got X percentage more than, than somebody else. Somebody else wouldn't have gotten anything from Steve Jobs had he not had the incentives of the market to cause him to create these huge cakes. Let me ask you guys a weird question. Who did more for the world? Mother Teresa or Michael Milken? <laughs> Mother Teresa was selfless and she helped lots of people. Michael Milken was this guy who went to jail. He supposedly broke financial rules. He invented junk bonds. Who did... Don, who did Michael Milken? Michael with, Milken did with, more. How? By making financing uh, financing much more efficient than it was, he made the capital markets more efficient. That made entrepreneurs better able to get 
access to to, to finance. By inventing to start. junk bonds, he uh, he allowed Revlon to grow, Mattel to grow, thousands of jobs, millions of jobs. As you know, yeah. junk bonds is just a it's, it's just a name for high interest bonds. High, high interest bonds, but it made capital more available. His that, greed helped more people than Mother Teresa. What say you? I mean, of course, I'm going to go with Mother Teresa. But, but again, she didn't I think create she, thousands of jobs no, that live uh, on uh, after of her. Of course, she, I mean, I, I that's sort of I don't know. I picked Mother Teresa because my heart goes out to her. I think she was a good person. But so I don't. Do I. I mean, there are lots of people who've created a lot of jobs in this world by sending American jobs overseas to China. That, according to greed, is good is a good philosophy. According to the American economy, it's a loser. No, right? it's not. So I'm not going to support ab, ab, it. Ab, ab, absolutely not. It's not a loser, says Don Boudreaux, because because when when tr nations trade more with other nations, they become wealthier. Americans benefit by trade with foreign nations. It's always happened. The data show that it happens. Right, we can't solve this tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Sally Cohn well, we and Don Boudreaux. Cake. Cake. Next, enjoy your cake. Can greed make you happy? My next guest says yes. He says we, says we should tap into our inner Gordon Gecko. Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed works? Well, yes, it does, though that's not a popular opinion. So I was surprised to read an article at cbsnews.com, of all places, that says, yes, embrace it, love it, live it, tap into your inner Gordon Gecko. What? The column was written by financial advisor Robert Pagliol... How do you say it? Pag Pagliarini. Pagliarini, thank you. So, really? Love it? Live it? What do you mean? Greed is good, for lack of a better word. Greed... No, it's, it's not, people in the audience are saying. Well, it, it is. Greed is selfish. I, I would argue that greed is a good thing. Greed is never bad. Greed saves lives. When you have companies, businesses, who are greedy inherently, looking to make a profit, they're designed to build better products, to create better services. That all benefits me and it benefits you, benefits everybody. You write that greed was the foundation for this country. It was. I don't see greed in the Declaration of Independence. No, but the pursuit of happiness, that is in the Declaration of Independence. But pursuit of happiness, happiness comes from family, people who believe in God are happier, uh, moving toward a goal that has a little to do with greed, but the others don't. Well, sure, family can make you happy, religion can make you happy. There are a lot of things Nothing that can make greed. somebody happy. But if I am relentlessly pursuing a goal, that could make me happy. Well, I'm talking about that burning desire. You know what you want and you're going to move mountains to get it. And uh, Gordon Gecko was implying that. Let, let's look at the rest of his speech from that first Wall Street movie, because he goes on beyond greed is good. He gets specific. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all of its forms. Greed for life, for money, for love, knowledge, has marked the upward surge of mankind, and greed you mark my words, will not only save Teldar paper, but that other malfunctioning corporation called the USA. Gordon Gecko is viewed in America as a selfish, evil guy. Right, and I think here's why. Because for so many of us, we think that if I'm pursuing something that's going to make me happy, that somehow that's going to hurt you. But, but it doesn't. Just because I'm going after what I want and you're going after what you want, that's what this country is all about. You're saying greed is just really just ambition. It, it or is Or maybe ambition. we should call it enlightened self-interest. It, it's people ambition. People would hate it less. It's, it's wanting something better. A better life, something better. You're an author, I'm an author. When you were up at one in the morning writing that book, it, it wasn't because you wanted to influence three or four people. You wanted to influence millions of people. It's that ambition, it's that desire for more that fuels us to pursue more makes us work harder, and most of that is toward good things. Absolutely. Now, you wrote a book, The Other Eight Hours, Maximize Your Free Time to Create New Wealth and Purpose. Uh, the Other Eight Hours, meaning you sleep for eight, you work for eight. The idea is you sleep a certain amount, you work a certain amount, but to get a little bit more greedy in the 
free time that you have, which is clearly not eight hours, but if you have a little bit of free time, get greedy with it. Take a little bit of, of that time and do something marvelous with your life. You take your own food to parties and, and this fits in to greed? Wow. It does. I am, I am quite greedy when it comes to my health. There are many things I do not eat. And so I will, it, with, at the embarrassment of my wife, bring my own food to various parties. And of course, I get, I get looks. They're like, well, why is he doing this? It's because also, I, I bet care. the host gets ticked off. He or their she feelings like it, are hurt. It, but that's okay. Do you know why it's okay? Because I care so much about myself and my health, I'm willing to sacrifice a dirty look or two to do that. New ways to think about the word greed. Thank you, Robert Pollyan. Pollyar. <laughs> you say it. Pallierini. Pallier. Uh, yeah. Coming up. Who is John Galt? And will Dagny Taggart eventually find him? The new Atlas Shrugged movie's coming. The new Atlas Shrugged movie just came out. It's now playing in a thousand theaters. Good. I say that because it's faithful to the book. And the book brilliantly predicted today, predicted the suffocating bureaucracy that gradually kills freedom and opportunity. Last year there was an Atlas movie too, but that was just part one of the series, and it was a rush job. Frankly, it wasn't that good. Part two is better. The movie maker had more time and more money to do it, and the movie maker is libertarian businessman John Aguilaro. So you made this happen. Uh, it bewilders me that nobody else made it happen over the years, because this book sells a million copies. Even now, 55 years after she wrote it, it's number 100 or something on the Amazon list. My book is way below that, and my <laughs> book is new. Um, it's been rated one of the most influential books in America after the Bible, and yet nobody made a movie about it. John, I bought the rights <clears throat> in 1992. I thought it would be a quick outsource. I thought that there would be a studio. They jump some, in Yeah, investors would jump all over it, but uh, it didn't happen. There were many false starts, and the rights were going to expire mid-June. So in early April, I just uh, went out and as an entrepreneur, tried to develop a team. We did develop a team, and uh, two and a half months later, we started principal photography. You spent $10 million of your own money. Yeah, production budget was about five and a half, and then the, uh, the rest of it was the other five. This one you had more time for, and you spent twice as much, again, of your own money. No, in, in part two, uh, I, I did put up part, but we had a half a dozen investors. But Other we did double the, uh, the budget to, uh, to 20 million <clears throat> with a 10, 10 million production budget. So the movie is set in the near future. There's social unrest because yeah. there are few jobs. Gasoline costs more than $40 a gallon because the government's rules have crushed the oil business. And a few entrepreneurs like Dagny Taggart are struggling to keep their businesses alive. Yeah. And that's faithful to the book. It is, it is. And we, uh, we discovered that um, there are so many uh, entrepreneurs who took to the movie and said, yeah, you know, I'm underappreciated, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm denigrated, and this movie uh, proved uh, very popular with them. Uh, because the political class and the business class, frankly, don't get along. I think Ayn Rand in that scene, it's a six-page scene in the book. She's really saying there that money is the root of all good. It's that information. It's information. But also money is fundamentally a barometer of a society's virtue. How? Because it allows people to create a life where they are producing to the maximum of their ability, and if they do it honestly, not fraudulently, then whatever ma maximum is, then people can seek the best within themselves. And money is the barometer or the, or the score that enables them to, to maximize their, their life and the amount of money they make. Reading Atlas Shrugged, that I only read it when I was in my 30s, I was impressed how she, years, 55 years ago, could know even the kind of terms that politicians use today. I mean, she wrote about laws like the Equal, Equalization of Opportunity Act. And in this scene, Hank Reardon's on trial for violating something called the Fair Share Act. If you believe you may seize my property simply because you need it, 
Well, then so does any burglar. Mr. Reardon, you are misrepresenting the letter and the intent of the fair share law. It is based on the highest principle, the principle of the public good. That sells in America today, the principle of the public good, fair share. It does unfortunately sell. But, you know, the underlying theme of that scene is that don't continue to denigrate me. Appreciate what the producers do. It's the yeah, jobs are not created. Don't. Jobs are not created by politicians. They're created by people. And what that scene, uh, you know, indicates is, if you continue to not appreciate what the entrepreneur does in creating the jobs and the wealth, the GNP of our society, we're going to shrug. We're going to go on strike. But people don't go on strike. In Atlas Shrugged, they go galt. They go to create their own world where the better people have a freer and more prosperous life. But in real life, you business types just take it. Yeah, up, up to recently, I think you're right. But John, it's happening. It's beginning to happen. Friends of mine who uh, will talk and they say, you know, I can go another year or two or five, but I'm going to stop. I'm going to sell my company. I'm going to go to a beach. I'm going to retire. I think you're going to see it more and more in the news, frankly. I think you're going to see entrepreneurs finally say, enough, watch us, it's going to happen. Uh, another part of the movie that I like was this quick exchange. You seem pretty happy I violated one of your new laws. <laughs> <laughs> That's what laws are for, Mr. Reardon. The right people don't break them. They're of no use whatsoever. I, I think about that when I think about the 150,000 pages of regulations that were forced to obey now, another thousand pages a week. People say, well, they don't really affect me, they won't hurt me. But it gives the government the power to selectively enforce, and that's dangerous. It is dangerous. I've been involved in 30 years uh, with dozens of different companies that we you bought. Cybex, the exercise equipment Cybex, company I'm CEO of Cybex, that's correct. Thanks for the uh, ARC trainer uh, opportunity uh, to say. But we have had, in the businesses I've had, constantly dozens of lawsuits every year i've been involved with several hundred i've settled dozens and dozens you of lawsuits. Hurt people the fact is there are so many lawsuits that entrepreneurs are constantly involved in because they're easy targets look at tv you see constantly lawsuits for mesothelioma or lung disease or one damn thing after another it's enough so you've said there's going to be a third movie to complete the trilogy there will be there will be a, uh, a third part. It'll complete the trilogy. Our target date is July 4th, 2014. We look forward to that. The new Atlas Shrug movie. Thank you, John Eglialaro. Coming up, we'll argue about the morality. Is capitalism and the wealth disparity that comes with it immoral? And I give you my take on all that's good about greed. social justice. We push for social justice and that's our job. And President Obama strongly believes in social justice. Social justice. And social justice here at home. Social justice. I'm sick of it. The left says they're for social justice and who could oppose that? If you do, you must be for what? Social injustice? I better be for social justice. But what that's come to mean is a big welfare state taken from rich people and giving it to the poor. And that just seems fair to people. John Tomasi faces that attitude all the time. He's a professor at Brown University, one of the most liberal schools in America. So you say free markets are the way to help the poor, but that can't go over well at Brown. Uh, it goes over fairly well. They're a little surprised by it at first, but I had some time to talk with them about what I mean. Many of them see the power of the idea. But as someone who contradicts some of these leftist ideas, aren't you a pariah? Isn't it hostile at Brown? <laughs> it's always interesting at Brown. And it's occasionally hostile, but usually it's not. Brown's, Brown's a wonderful place. Well, I say hostile because I had my own experience there. I went there to cover a story years ago because a Brown student was hounded out of school after he slept with a young woman who later said she was drunk and therefore couldn't give consent. And therefore that was rape. I wanted to ask about that because when I went to college, sex and alcohol were often combined. And what was this new definition of rape? An activist there said this was not a discussion that should even be allowed. Get off the 
this campus. We don't want you here. Rape is not TV hype. Come on, everybody, louder. At this school, something you'll learn is that there is one opinion, and the other opinion turns out to be wrong. And then somebody <laughs> pulled out my mic cord, and they screamed, rape is not TV hype. So this yeah. is my understanding about Brown, the totalitarian left. It's, Unfair? It's, it's not Brown's, that was not Brown's finest moment. And some of those students, in fact, I had just arrived at Brown as a new professor when that happened. And some of those students were in my office before they went to meet you. And I urged them not to go because, in that instance, Brown was wrong dead wrong on that case and i also said to them if you go he'll eat you up for, he'll eat you for lunch which you did so, well, but, brown, but brown has changed exactly. a lot since then well I, i'm glad to hear that all right so let's go to this other controversy <laughs> um you have written a book free market fairness and i would think brown students and many americans would say what's fair about the free market because it creates this wealth disparity some are yes. much richer than others yes well, I think if, uh, free market fairness can only be make, made sense of if we know what fairness is. So we have to ask, what is justice or what is fairness? Most people think, most yeah, brown social students think, justice is they think it means something like equality. So if you want to have a fair society or a just society, you, you should have a society where there's lots of redistribution from, of taxation from the rich to the poor, and that's a just society. Especially compared to a society with great inequality, a society where, say, some of the rich people got rich because their parents were rich, they had advantages. It's unfair. So which of these two societies is more fair? Most brown freshmen, fresh off the boat a month ago, coming into my class and think, well, this one's fair, obviously. But now let's just play for a minute. Let's play it over 10 years, 15 years, 25 years. The society that encourages equality and focuses on those questions does not grow very much. But a society that celebrates entrepreneurs, celebrates a certain kind of greed, urges people to go out there and make great things for themselves, that society starts to grow. But now let's look at it again. Which of these two societies is more fair? Which is more just? Well, watch my thumbs. <laughs> my thumbs indicate the poorest people. If you say this is the just society, that means you care about equality, but not the poor. I think fairness requires that we focus on the poor. And we ask and evaluate the whole social system by asking, at least in part, how does the system tend to work for the poor, for the working poor, over time? even though it's more unequal. Absolutely, absolutely. That, equal, that inequality is going to do some driving to pull that lowest group up. And what's really important, it's such, it's such a basic quite a point for students especially, what do we really care about for a just society? Is it this or is it the poor? And I think we should focus on the poor. When we focus on the poor, capitalist arguments start looking a lot better. And this goes back to the conversation we had earlier about the cake. Yes. That to the left, there's yes. a cake, and Bill Gates takes a big piece. That's right. You say... I say we should ask ourselves what kind of a society we want to work in, live in. What kind of society should it be? A better, morally more attractive community is one that encourages people to unleash their creativity in the world, to stand up on their own two feet, makes them able and wanting to become authors of their own lives, that's the community that we want to live in. We want to have a community where people are want all. Be, we, everyone wants to become a cake builder, a cake baker. Everyone wants to become, become a cake baker and make more cakes, new cakes, new kinds of confections we haven't even thought of yet. That's the better society. It's a better society for people. And by the end of the term at Brown, your students start to come around a little a bit. A lot of them do. A lot of them do. Um, this is sort of a new v version of libertarianism that people call bleeding heart libertarians. Some of my students at Brown joke about it, that I'm bringing the gospel of a change of libertarian thinking addressing the social justice, and they call it the gospel according to John. Now, you know, that's a little overdone, but, but, but that's something that they do say at Brown. All right, what about, my, <laughs> what about my earlier question then? Who did more for the world? Mother Teresa or the jailed Michael Milken? Oh, what a painful question. My, I have a gr my grandmother, Mary O'Connell, is a devout Catholic and a huge fan of Mother Teresa, and she's about to roll over in her grave. Forgive me, toots. Michael Milken did far more for the world than Mother Teresa. For one obvious reason, and not just his philanthropy, which was really important also, but the work he did to make capital markets more efficient. It created wealth. It enabled people to stand up on their own two feet as causes of their own lives, to become economically independent, and that's a really important gift that he didn't know he was doing. He didn't intend to do that. He may not have he even did. cared. He may not have even cared. But what a, what a magical thing to help other people become responsible causes of their own lives. What more respectful way could we live together? Thank you, John Tomasi. When we come back, a different take on what really helps poor people. We want more prosperity, and not just for us, but for people all over the world. We're poor. We have to stand up for the free enterprise system. 
Greed is a nasty word. People talk about today's greed, but come on, people have always been greedy. Greed's a constant. The beauty of a free market, though, is that it harnesses greed. So pursuing profit produces good stuff for most everyone. The way to get rich in a free market is to serve your customers well. I think that makes the market moral. Maybe I shouldn't use the word greed. I should call it enlightened self-interest. Two people who have done more than most anyone to explain how capitalism is moral are Steve Forbes, author of the new book, Freedom Manifesto, Why Free Markets Are Moral and Big Government Isn't. And Arthur Brooks of the American Enterprise Institute. Arthur, you recently made a video that tries to explain the morality of free enterprise. It's already been viewed 100,000 times on YouTube before we talk about greed. Let's play this part of, the, of your video. Since 1970, the worst poverty in the world, which is to say the percentage of the population that lives on a dollar a day or less, has declined by 80%. 80%! There's been no achievement like that in human history. Billions of people have been lifted out of poverty. It's the most amazing thing that humanity has ever accomplished. So what happened? Was it the incredible success of the United Nations? Was it central planning or the International Monetary Fund or global foreign aid? Of course not. It was globalization. It was free trade. It was entrepreneurship. It was property rights. It was rule of law. In short, it was free enterprise that saved all those people. If we want more prosperity, and not just for us, but for people all over the world who are poor, we have to stand up for the free enterprise system. It's truly the system for good Samaritans. Most people don't believe that. I would say most people think it is the UN or foreign aid or central planning. China, China's boomed. Right. It's wrong. It turns out that the, what saved China was that since 1980, they've opened up to foreign trade. Look, there's still a totalitarian dictatorship. There's a lot of stuff wrong. But one of the things they've gotten right is empowering entrepreneurs and opening up to trade with the United States, which since 1980 is up a thousand percent. The and also, the, they started to honor private property it, around exactly, that time. Exactly. There's only one way to do it. We have this graph that shows how China has boomed, not just since they started central planning, but when they recognized private property. That's right. That This is literally what we've seen since 1980, has lifted 400 million Chinese out of poverty. But Steve, I would say most Americans think trade hurts the average American, or certainly the guy working in the factory, because if it's with China, he's losing a job to somebody in China. Well, this gets to uh, your introduction on the word greed. Uh, greed in people's minds means taking something that doesn't belong to you. What you in the free market, what you have is transactions. Uh, you want something, I want something, we have an exchange. Money makes it much easier. They might want a treasury bill, I may want a pair of socks, we make a swap. And so uh, that way we each get something. And we have a free market where people can do things, innovate, and try things, and see what people want. You see, free markets, and this is what uh, the UN won't tell you, is free markets is about meeting the needs and wants of other people. Government's about meeting its own needs. And Arthur is right. 40 million companies in China are what is driving that economy, not the state-owned companies. But the perception is free markets are cold, amoral, uncaring. They're actually the opposite. They're the biggest breaker down of barriers between people. You may not love your neighbor, but you sure want to sell you to your neighbor. Brings about, we take it for granted, John, in this country, that if you start a business, you want the best people possible because you want to uh, succeed. That's new in human history. Before, you rarely trusted anyone beyond your immediate family or community or ethnic group. Commerce breaks down those barriers so people, whether they know it or not, they're cooperating with each other. Think about it this way. All, all three of us, we descended from immigrants. Most Americans descended from immigrants. I bet your great-grandparents, John, didn't come to America saying, I want to get to America for a better system of forced income redistribution. <laughs> I bet they my father, actually, but no. <laughs> yeah, I bet, I bet your ancestors... He came here to clean toilets and then to repair to, toilets. He came here to be rewarded for his hard work and merit for the first time in his life. That's what markets allow us to do. They're the great equalizer. I work harder, I innovate, I get rewarded. That doesn't happen in other countries. That's why markets are not about greed. Markets are about a better life through earned success. But the poor, I'm told, are left behind. Paul Krugman talking about Paul Ryan's budget. He says Paul Ryan explicitly is trying to make life harder for the poor. Yeah, that's that's completely false, and I'll tell you why. It goes with your argument about dependency, but well, you you want to cut off all these programs and make the poor suffer? <laughs> Actually, I don't. 
The, what I want to do is, for the truly poor of this country, we need two things. We need relief and we need opportunity. If you want to guarantee relief to the most indigent members of society, you must have a functioning economy. You and I will be inconvenienced by a debt crisis in this country, which will come if we don't change course. The poor will lose everything, and that's catastrophic, and that's and immoral. And that's why they need bigger programs, they say. And, and, and Krugman assumes once you're poor, you're always poor. He assumes like we're still in medieval Europe. Once a peasant, always a peasant. No, here you become a landlord. All right, but address the criticism, because what they're saying is that we who want to cut are going to punish the poor, as Chris Matthews put it. They believe the way to get rich is, uh, is to work harder and give the rich people more money. That'll help them. The way to get the poor people to work harder is to screw them. That's take a, away their progress. No, Look. it takes away their dependency. So they're not uh, dependent on Uncle Sam. It gives them a sense of empowerment, allows them to get skills so They'll they can move starve. up. They starve. Yeah, food stamps. You ever heard of food stamps? You know, 30 years ago, Chris Matthews would have said, we should have a program so everyone gets a cell phone. They cost them $3,995. You know, today, if Chris Matthews had had his way, or Krugman had his way, it would be $10,995. They'd be decrying selfish cell phone makers and the like, and uh, we'd have like we have health care. Scarcity into abundance, creating resources. That's what about not their static mind of a medieval economy. Nobody wants to throw granny out in the snow. Nobody wants to take away all services from the poor. What we want is to make sure people don't become dependent and people still live in an opportunity society and the rest of us actually are on our own to make our own way to earn our own success to live a dignified life in which we can say I earned that thank you Arthur Brooks and Steve Forbes coming up my take on greed thank you. the recession was brought on largely by greedy Wall Street corporations and the folks know they're suffering because of Wall Street excess. That's all true. No, Bill, that's not true. I hate it that even my colleagues don't get it. The recession happened because economies have booms and busts. That's just how they work. Government made our last one worse by interfering with the market, giving out guarantees and subsidies. Yeah, Wall Street was greedy, but that's not new. Greed's a constant, not just on Wall Street. Everyone wants more. Did you ever turn down a raise? I don't. The beauty of a free market is that the market itself regulates greed. If you charge too much, the next guy offers it for less and you lose. Greed's tempered by competition. The left says the way to help people is through government, but greed, or better, the free market, works better. Now, I'm about to eat this juicy steak. How'd I get this? Looks awfully good. How'd I get it, though, here in New York City? Do I have this because some rancher miles away wants to be good to me and ship me the steak? No, I have it because thousands of people care about themselves. I first learned this years ago. It's sunrise in Manning, Iowa. At the Weiss farm, David Weiss is saddling up for another 14-hour workday. There's so much work for the ranchers. Fixing fences, digging ditches, feeding the cows, harvesting hay. The Weeses are only the first of a series of people who, by caring about themselves, make sure I get my steak. There's Virgil Rosanke, who delivers the propane that heats the cattle's water. They've got to drink water, and they can't drink frozen water. Wanda Nelson keeps the packing house clean. To make sure the plant is sanitized before we start production. Then there are the people who slaughter the cattle, who cut the beef, the people, people who make their knives, their overalls, their protective gear, and the people who make the plastic that seals the meat, and the machines that do the sealing, and the people who pack the meat in boxes, and the people who make the boxes and inspect the boxes. You gotta check the boxes to make sure they don't get bad boxes. Then there are the people who run the freezer facilities, the people, people who track orders by barcode, the people who make the barcode machines, and the truck driver who's hauling my steak to New York. Thousands of people have to work together to get the food to market. Are they doing all this for me? No, I don't think of it that way. No. <laughs> I think about making boxes and money. <laughs> Who's John Stossel? I'm no one to Virgil you know Rasenk. I never heard of him. Virgil and those others might not care about me, and yet they do work hard and cooperate to bring me steak. It's kind of a miracle getting all those people to work together. Governments can't do it. They've tried, but mostly failed miserably. 
You remember the long lines, and sometimes people starved. There was no food. But free markets provide us food every day. We should celebrate that. That's our show.